Ahmad um, with the Digital Focus. Um, the idea is that we come together, we kind of help each other out with our own theses, and they're not all necessarily digital related as of right now, but that is um, our interest when we come together, we do sort of other projects um, here and there. So this is kind of our own, our first project as a, as a group, and um, when we started Film Lab, we wanted to do something um, together where we can learn um, digital news, digital technology that we don't already know, and sort of um, kind of also brand ourselves and get our name out there. So this, we decided to apply for the Grow Up um, exhibit in April, that just happened in April, and um, uh, as a way to kind of work collectively and learn new things. Um, and we wanted to do, uh, so Grow Up is a um, exhibit at the Glassstone in April and it was, the idea was to kind of bring artists together, artists, landscape architects, designers together and explore new ideas for landscape design and people's involvement with their surrounding environments. And um, so we wanted to kind of create this synthetic landscape that where people can get really involved um, with this kind of um, art piece or installation or kind of um, artificial um, landscape. Um, and So just read the first paragraph so you get an idea of what we had in mind when we designed this thing. This is the description of the book for um, Grow Up. Grow Up is interested in discovering new dynamic relationships within, between people and their surroundings. With Field Guide, we aim to construct an effective environment that provokes people's extensive perceptual participation and to total bodily involvement with the space. The project involves not only an intricate modular surface, but also an integrated digital system that allows for the installation's dynamic engagement with the participants. Um, so the uh, installation happened at the Gladstone Hotel's lobby. I don't know if you guys have been there, but basically it's a pretty hotel in um, downtown Toronto, and um, they do a lot of uh, art exhibits um, come up with, um, come up to my room this year and grow up did their first um, inaugural year here as well in April. Um, so we were right in the lobby. Um, the other exhibits were actually all upstairs. Um, but we had this we're probably the biggest installation at the show. And um, we got to talk to a lot of people um, like artists who exhibit it here, and also people that were interested in the show. Um, a lot of people come in without really knowing that it's an interactive piece. You kind of walk by, look up, and it's like this white, pretty kind of intricate ceiling piece, and without knowing that it actually can move. Um, and then once we showed it to people, they were like, oh, this is so cool. Um, we haven't seen something like this before. Or like, that if you didn't tell me, like I would never notice it. Um, and um, I think people generally enjoyed that it's kind of an interactive piece, and kids really love it. The only thing is they're a little too short to kind of activate it, so they like get their parents to pick them up and kind of activate the sensor. So we have um, kind of replicated what we had installed here, um, basically. Um, these are all the hardware that we have, and then, um, so it's got a sensor, a motor, and an Arduino. We'll get into the details soon. Um, we didn't hang the fabric up, because this way you can sort of get a closer view of it. Um, but basically, the fabric ha hangs off of 
the motors and also it gets attached to these um, aircraft cables that we hang up um, and then these motors kind of carry them and they do a little dance kind of thing. Um, So yeah, there's six sensors that hang, hang um, off of the ceiling and basically if you walk by it or you put your hands underneath it. Um, it kind of requires a little bit of time to activate it, but um, if you kind of just walk by it doesn't really do anything, but if you put your hand underneath it, it um, activates the system and agitates the surface, um, as you can see here. It's a little toppy. I'll talk a little bit about the process, how we came to the design. Um, basically, it's a huge learning curve for all of us. And none, um, none of us has worked with Arduino before or any sort of digital system. Um, so we knew that it's something that we can learn um, fairly quickly because there's a lot of resources online um, to help us with learning Arduinos and playing with kind of this digital system. Um, so back in February, after we had, we knew we had gone in, um, we were approved with our design and everything. They wanted to see like an initial rendering of what this thing might look like uh, pretty early on because they were concerned about the image of the hotel because we're still prominent in their space. Um, so this was the rendering that we sent in. We took a, like we debated for a long time how this thing would look like. Um, and then uh, we kind of um, Petra here to be but basically Petra had um, made sort of a very similar surface that was made out of these small mylar modules and we really liked the look of that and um, kind of built on top of that idea and developed a new type of module I think this was hers um, so there are like two Y-shaped modules, but we had we had something a little bit different than that, um, and kind of made a, a different pattern out of that. And then um, um, kind of explored how this thing can move dynamically. We had attached strings, so when you pull on just different sides of the string, it'll kind of um, create different shapes. Um, kind of created a, the first prototype of you know what. A small section of this may be. Um, we'll get into the, the fabric in detail later on. Um, uh, one thing that we have um, kind of debated along the process was um, like what kind of actuation will the system do? Like whether it's LED, um, you know, like we wanted to do an interactive. And so the sensing part of it would either be motion, could be heat, um, uh, and then we were thinking like, what's the output of that? And so we had talked about like you know LED lights, um, like a gradient of LED lights that respond to you know people's movement, or maybe it's like these like kind of um, polymer shapes that respond to the different currents that go through them. Um, a lot of things like we could only speculate because we didn't really know what our capacity is or how what we could do with what we already know or how much things we could learn in a short period of time. But um, we I think we've decided on working with motors because um, to have something move is pretty incredible in our mind. Um, uh, so we had decided that we're going to 
work with the motors and you try to make something move. Um, but what that meant was very unclear to us. So we had experimented with um, with sort of figuring out the mechanism of how to carry something to move. Um, what are kind of the different mechanisms that create different movements, um, and also trying to figure out what type of motor we're using. Um, we never worked with motors before. We couldn't really tell the difference between stepper motor, DC motor, and servo motor. So here we're experimenting with like all three of them. Actually, that's a stepper, that's a DC, that's a servo. Um, we had a lot of help from different people trying to help us with these things. Philip Beasley, John Terrell, Dave, all of them helped us a lot in trying to figure out this thing. Um, and we also like looked at online tutorials and things like that. Um, so this is our first time uh, making the motors move um, without a sensor. Um, we wrote a, I'm not too familiar with the code Mary, and we'll talk about the code later on. Um, but um, here we have two servo motors hooked onto an Arduino with a, with a motor shield on it, uh, this thing. Um, so this thing allows you to do all kinds of, it's a motor shield, so you could do any motor stuff or DC or servo, all of them can be hooked onto this. Um, here we have two servo motors, so that was pretty exciting to get some stuff moving. Um, and then this having to hooking up a sensor to it was a totally different story. Um, when I think the code got a lot more um, complicated and we had to calibrate the sensor um, because here, this is the first time we got the sensor moving with motors, but the reaction time was really slow. It took, it's like, sort of had this like two second reaction time for it to react to the sensing. Um, so the sensor, the sensors are uh, uh, infrared sensors, so they they can sense distance. Um, you can calibrate, you know, how far your hand needs to be so that this responds to it. Um, again, Miriam will talk more about that. Um, so that was, this was back in March, I think we were sort of at a point where we're like, okay, we really want to figure this out, but we don't know how much time we have. Um, and we kind of, some of us wanted to give up and say, you know what, we're going to give up motors and do LED lights because it's a lot easier to figure out. Uh, but then um, some people, I think the group sentiment was still that we wanted to make this work and also try to learn something um, that we had decided in the first place. Um, so we we went to Philip's office and we had this like intensive working day there and and Saran um, was the code person. Saran and Miriam were the code person and they were uh, trying try to like, calibrate the the sensors and altering the code and we did you know different tests with the different shields that we were working. We actually used two different shields. One was the motor shield that I was talking about and the other one is the MOX shield. Um, different uh, shields and basically this one allows for m more customization in terms of what you can do it due to it. Um, here I'm talk about that. Um, here we have um, the surface hook up to it. So there's a sensor you can't really see them. Another thing that we had to learn was soldering. Um, I don't think any of us knew how to solder before this. Um, 
And it seemed like this intimidating thing because you had to work with like sort of a hot iron and wires and things. So uh, Dave was really great. He gave us like a crush course on how to solder. Um, Tay showed us how to solder as well. Um, and uh, you actually don't need masks to solder. Um, we kind of made a big deal out of that. <laughs> but it is toxic and try not to like breathe in the toxic air. But, um, but um, yeah, that was another thing that we had to learn. Um, and just if you're interested in like learning any of the things that I that we're showing you right now, feel free to come by. We have all the toys. We have soldering guns. We have a connect. We have all these wiring and sensors and motors. Um, if you would like to try any of that, um, feel free to come in. Um, okay. And then when the days came for install, that was come kind of a, in a complicated situation because we were located in the lobby uh, of Gladstone Hotel. We had a lot of traffic in that area, so we were only allowed to install in the morning, very early in the morning. Um, so for, I think, six days, we had to um, drive all the way to Toronto, install for three hours, and then come back. And like basically driving really early in the morning, like, the earliest we had to get up was like 3.30 in the morning. And, um, heading to Toronto at four, getting there at six, yeah. um, trying to unpack everything, set up, install for three hours, and then drive back. <laughs> uh, this happened for six days uh, throughout the weekend. Um, and um, I guess the kind of uh, setup um, we had was that we would do the structure, which is like these aircraft cables that you see here first, and then uh, zipping all the hardware up um, and testing them and then putting the circuits up after that. Um, yeah, this is, you can't really see what's going on here, but someone's on the ladder, kind of, in the cloud trying to fix something. Um, I'll talk about the kind of different components that I lightly touched upon earlier. Um, this, we kind of had a rough plan of where we're going to put things, so um, we were asked to stay at the, not on top of the receptionist desk, but on the opposite side of it. Um, and we weren't allowed to drill into the ceiling or anything, so we had to hang these cables across the room. Um, so we had uh, four cables this way and then I can't remember how many this way. But basically they are on a grid so that we can hang the surface and the hardwares off of them. Um, the, we had six modules. We've been calling them modules because um, they're sort of almost identical pieces that make up this thing. And um, each module has uh, an Arduino. Uh, so that's your control board where you, where you write your codes on. Uh, and then two motors and one sensor. So the sensor activates both motors. Um, and then there's a surface that associates to each module. And then in the end, we decided to connect them together. So you can't really tell the different clouds, but there are six of them. Um, And in this section, you can see the number five is, no, the line on the very top is are these cables that we hung. And then the uh, motors, and number seven is the shield, they all hang off of the cable. And we had designed these acrylic um, kind of rigs to hang them off of. I guess I could pass this around. This is a servo motor, and so we had to cut all these acrylic pieces so that they can be zipped onto the line. And, um, and then the surfaces are hung off the motors and the line, the aircraft cables. Um, and then the sensor kind of comes out of the cloud, and so then you can see them and kind of system. Um, here are the 
different components that we were talking about. And um, we kind of consulted this with Philip a lot because he's done this extensively. Um, he kind of helped us figure out you know, how to how to design these these acrylic bricks to hang these things. And, um, so he had suggested that we use sign grade acrylic, and I had um, called a couple places, found it. Um, it's, it's supposed to be this like very flexible acrylic that. Um, so you can cut them um, very precisely and have these kind of snap fit um, components. Um, so they're all friction fit, there's no glue or anything. Um, but I think we, the acrylic we got is not exactly the same as what he got, so they kept on snapping. Um, but uh, some of them are holding up and um, we might have to improve on finding a different material. But this is a laser cut file the kind of different components that we had to cut. Um, here's a motor. Um, the Arduino shields also have their own housing. They're kind of, they've been falling apart. Um, but uh, that's kind of, you can see it here actually. That's what we're um, Here is the um, spider, we've been calling it. Um, that's um, attached to the sensor. We kind of designed this so that so that the sensors can be more visible to the visitors um, because once you have the cloud and it's like all sort of um, regular in terms of its form and we wanted something that's very different from that so that it can catch people's eyes and so that they could come up to it and activate um, the system. Um, here's a sensor thing that I was showing you before. Um, we designed it um, so that it can swing um, both ways. Um, yeah, to give it a bit more flexibility and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, we can talk about the fabric now. So actually we'll talk about the fabric and Miriam will get into the code and the hardware and stuff. <laughs> a lot of mylar and uh, for the fabric for the design of it we were inspired by Petra's design which may mentioned upon it it's kind of like these Y uh, modules connected together by these buttons that she sewed upon and so we created a different design for the module um, it's kind of like these two circles with the tail tail on both circles kind of thing and the reason for that was because we wanted to maximize the loop within the um, module. So, so we taped it up and it kind of became like this uh, infinity loop with these two tails, which then we could, which then at that time we decided to pin it up and make it look like that. Um, However, the intensity of the labor of pinning these uh, modules was quite great. So we thought of a different system. Oops. Where you can see um, we use slots and uh, taps. The top will, it's like this is the laser cut board, laser cutting board. So it's about 32 by 18 mm -hmm. size, yeah. And so that's how many we fit in each uh, session. So the top part is the slots, the bottom part is the tabs, and um, we use a similar process where it'd be easier to, yep, you can pass that around. And that's, you can pass that one around as well because that's how we pinned all of them together before we thought of the slots and tab idea. Um, so these are the slots and tabs that I'll be passing around. So going over the process again, making it a loop. Put 
putting in the tabs through the slots. And then pairing them. So it, it would bring it, it be together like this. And the reason for this is so that we could We could then make rows uh, where the paired slots and the paired, ta paired tab would connect with each other, which would then be connected diagonally uh, by individual modules again. So we had, um, depending on the size that was provided for us, we had five, you know, three different sizes for our modules. Um, there were three small ones, two medium, and one large. Uh, and they were then wrapped in newspaper so it'd be easier to transport. That's it. Okay, so I'm going to get to one of the really exciting parts of it. this installation, which is the electronics and kind of how we made it move. Um, so initially when we had um, kind of conceived of how the system would interact, being architects, we looked at some fairly complicated systems. Um, one that we were pretty fixated on in the beginning is called the cellular automata, which is a system, a model in computer science where each unit or cell receives information from its neighbor and changes according to the data that it receives. So that um, if you can look at this model over here, every cell is feeding on information next to it and changing according to that so that you would have this kind of system of clouds that would very infinitely, or so that when someone stood under one of these modules, it would have a ripple effect on all of its neighbors. Um, we eventually simplified it to just a number of modules or cells that each had an input from one sensor and two motors. And because we're using this lightweight fabric um, that we connected together into a single piece of canopy, it actually still had a ripple effect in the end, where once we activated this, it kind of shook everything next to it. So we had learned Arduino about, in, back in the fall term, FormLab had run um, an Arduino tutorial and so we had some very basic knowledge of Arduino, like turning lights on and off, getting input and output. Um, so this is the Arduino board. It has 13 digital signal pins up here, which can receive either input or output. So input can be anything like a sensor or a button or um, a switch, out, or they can be turned to output so they can output lights, they can output um, motors, they can output sound, and so on. Um, there are also analog pins down here. Um, digital pins just do on and off. The analog pins down here um, will receive analog information, so actually receive numbers. So the sensor is actually hooked up to an analog pin while the motors, which I'll explain a bit later, as well as the LED light here, are hooked up, hooked up to digital pins. So this is, um, as we've mentioned before, this is the motor that we used, which is a servo motor. Um, I think it's going around the room, or maybe it's landed somewhere. Um, so the difference between a servo motor and a normal motor is that most motors move continuously clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, but the servo motor allows you to 
control accurately um, where which degree it goes to. So it allows you to more accurately con control the physical movement. Um, so you can set the motor to a position between um, 0 and 180 degrees. So these ones go to 90. Um, so here we are, they respond to a pulse. Um, so between, so in one millisecond, they would rotate in one direction. If you set it to two milliseconds, it rotates in the other direction, 180 degrees. And you want it to move to a specific degree that you would calibrate it between a pulse of one and two. Um, so this is the code we're doing here. Um, and the motors each have a signal cable um, a ground cable, which is the black one here, and um, a power cable, which is the red one here. So the red cable is actually connected to five volts, whereas um, the ground, the black cable is connected to ground on the Arduino board. Um, and I'll just show you exactly how it is on the board. So if you go back to the Arduino board, these are all the signal pins, and over here there are options for power. Um, including three volts, five volts, and two grand pins. So this is how you would set up a single motor on an Arduino board. We wanted, initially we wanted four motors. So if you if you know if you'll notice, there are actually not enough power pins for each of our motors. So we had to go to either the motor shield, um, which is this one here. Um, I don't know if we've passed this around yet. Or the MUX shield, which is this one here. Um, the motor shield has options for different motors to be plugged into it. So there, um, these shields are additional boards that you would plug onto your normal Arduino board. Um, and the way they work is when you look at the documentation on them, you'll find something intimidating looking like this, which basically shows how the circuits run from the bottom board which is the Arduino board, and the shield which is being plugged into it, and how those um, signal pins transfer their signals and kind of branch them out into more pins so that you would have more pins to plug your motors into. Um, so for instance, on the MUX shield here, our, a normal Arduino board has the row of 13 pins up here and 6 pins down here and power over here. Um, the MUX shield takes these pins and breaks them out into 16 additional mark pins per each of these M0, M1, and M2 boards. So each of these are basically giant switches um, with different control settings um, so that M0, which is attached to a pin called pin 14, um, you can kind of go into the binary code of that and set this to different settings for, to, in order to turn on pin 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 on this board. And you can do the same thing with each of these. So I'll just, and this is called the MUX shield, which is short for multiplexing, which is what this system of setting pins to multiple positions is. So I'll show you what that looks like in <laughs> the next 
So this is what this looks like in code. Um, you're actually accessing the binary code of the pins. So it's a whole bunch of zero, one, one zeros. And pin one, for instance, has a binary code of one zero, zero, zero versus pin two. And this is all information that you can find online that takes a bit of digging. Um, so here we have, for instance, for this code, we're turning on S3, which is, pin, we're turning on pin 8, where S3 is, um, needs to have 1, so it's on high, which is what turns it on. S2, um, S1, and S0 are all turned to low, which is what turns it off. Okay. So here was our first attempt to get four of these motors plugged in to get it going. What we discovered, though, was that Arduino boards are not, which um, are supplied with a nine volt power source, and which then takes the power into the Arduino board and channels it out as five volts um, output, they max out. So while we could get four small servos going, um, and servo motors come in different sizes, um, while we get four small ones going, we wanted to use some slightly bigger ones to hold up this piece of fabric um, to support the weight of it. And we realized that it actually maxed out at three motors. Um, so we eventually decided to use just two motors so that we could kind of, we could have the motors move in a parallel motion to shape the fabric. Um, we had initially wanted to use four motors so that we could grab four corners of this cloud and kind of shape that around. So for the sensors, um, like I had mentioned before, well this is our infrared, sharp infrared sensor. Um, they also require power um, in terms of the 5 volts power ground and input from input from to a signal pin. Um, and this is an analog pin, so the sensor actually records data in sensor values. Um, so this is an uncalibrated sensor, I say. So with this sensor, it detects um, an object's under it and the distance from that. But it records that in its own value, which runs from 0 to 1,000. Now, the sensor, if you look at the data sheets, it actually records, um, it, it can actually detect objects that are 20 centimeters to 1.5 meters away. Um, so if you look over here, this is from Yeah, this is from the data sheet of the sensor. It records, um, it can detect objects that are 20 centimeters close to it. If you get closer to that, it actually, it actually gets very fuzzy. Um, and it can record um, information that's up to 1.5 meters away. Um, but in order to take the data that the sensor receives and kind of calibrate that to the actual distance that you want it at, um, you have to put this formula in your code. So here, there's more of our sensor testing, kind of calibrating it to certain distances, seeing how far we can detect movement. Yep. Does that depend on skin tone too, like the color? Reflectance of the object would change the sensor output, right? I I guess there's a certain extent we haven't 
test your pet out. <laughs> okay. It depends on. It's like um, when you have an obstacle in front of it, it detects that there is an obstacle, and that it's like almost a reflecting. Oh, it's um, time-based thing, but not these an are intensity. Proximity sensors, right? So they detect yeah. distance. Yeah, okay. They detect distance as mm -hmm. an infrared sensor that um, detects tone or heat. Well, okay. these are these are infrared sensors, so they do they detect something that's directly under it. But is it a time of flight or an intensity based system, I guess? I think it's based on I think it's based on the intensity because it doesn't detect passing motion, which was what we had it kind of imagined and what we're kind of used to with a lot of sensors that we have, like the sensors that turn on the lights in this building. Um, but you actually do have to be like if I just kind of pass by and that really happens, I kind of do have to be directly um, so this was our final code where um, and the, the way because two of us worked on this we wrote um, a main code and classes of code so that's kind of like AutoCAD where you have main AutoCAD files and AutoCAD extracts where we have extracts or blocks for setting the direction of the code, setting the speed of the motor, and then a main code that calls the code to all of our signal pins. Um, and this is how it's laid out, our sensor, our two motors, and the LED light. So we actually had the sensors calibrated at the distance of the meter for our installation. Um, however, we noticed that when most people came up to the installation, they were actually inclined to put their hands directly under it, um, as opposed to, and, and because the sensor, we do have to be kind of at a straight line um, from the sensor in order for it to detect motion. If you're kind of over here, it won't detect any, um, anything under it. Um, yeah, we noticed that people really just interacted with it within a certain range. Do you think that would have been different if you had one of those the motion type sensor instead? Yeah, like I, I think originally we had kind of intended it for it to catch people's movement as they pass by, and that's why we wanted it in a lobby space where we were going to capture circulation versus um, versus where people stood. Mm. But in fact, our installation was most active when there were people kind of at the counter checking in and then they would be directly under it, mm -hmm. and then this beast would start moving mm -hmm. over their heads. <laughs> um, so what's next? We reinstalled, we were, we actually received a request from Pacific Action Group in Toronto, which is a nonprofit organization that works with the Toronto Alliance, I think, for a number of initi initiatives. For instance, they're the ones who, according to their website, they started um, an initiative to like improve Toronto commuting times, and they kind of have that as an advertisement on the TTC. I don't know a lot about it. Yeah, if you um, see on the TTC, there's like posters that says, like, What's, what do you do when you're 32? That's done. Basically, mm -hmm. we want to improve the system. Um, not 
directly working with Metrolinx, but they um, they are trying to do campaigns so people are aware of the transit system. So they had um, they had a fundraising event in Toronto, and they had approached us after they had seen our work at the OA lecture, and one of their developers had seen our installation at the Gladstone to have it reinstalled for their events. Um, we're also hoping to redevelop this for the Acadia Conference this fall. Um, 